the man who lives an authentic life, uh, which would be an Eastern mysticism known as the Dharmic life, and the man who's inauthentic, and that's the karmic life. So when we look around the world, we see these two kinds of people. And the, the problem is that in the inauthentic model, there's tremendous second, uh, there's primary guilt. Guilt, not of the kind that we normally know when we do some little misdemeanor or we've hurt some, you know, person's feelings or whatever, that type of nonsense. That's just secondary guilt, lesser guilt. There is an existential guilt based on your own inner subconscious commitment to live an inauthentic life. And from that guilt and from that commitment to live the inauthentic life comes an entire inverted tree of life of many, many other syndromes, you know, and many other complexes that we're familiar with in the world. One of those branches, one of those symptoms, is then man's penchant to submit. Uh, because the answer to your question in one single sentence is this. Man has found it more satisfactory, and believe me, this is irrational, but nevertheless he's made this irrational decision. As irrational as it is, he's made a decision rather to submit to external forms of tyranny, external forms of control, which are partly punitive, but also partly permissive. I mean, the slave is going to have some food, and he's going to have some shelter, and he'll be told what to do. You know, and he'll have the camaraderie of other slaves and so on. So the slave mentality, the man who submits, has in fact chosen to submit to external authorities, regardless of how tyrannical they are, rather than face the journey on the Siddhartha road towards an understanding and a, a, an attainment of his own selfhood. This might be difficult for people to understand who are not familiar with psychology, who are not familiar with you know spirituality. But even in Christian terms, you find the, the same teachings, that you, you either have the truth or you have the non-truth. You have submittance to the, the world of the debauchery, or whatever you want to call it, to the lower drives, to the lower instincts, you know, to the lower men. So this is the this is the nub of it, and I've done you know interviews and, and we've talked about this in the DVDs, and we very much talk about it in the Architects of Control series. That here is a man who is committed within his subconscious to not live an authentic life. Then he wants to cluster with others who have made the similar decision, and that's what we have in societies is an inauthentic, you know, collective. But it's based out of people who would rather submit to the external tyrannies of Big Daddy, who'd rather cling to the handrails, who'd rather lean on one another, than face the anxiety that arises when you have to go on the inner journey of truth, when you have to discover what you're really here for on this planet, and who you are yourself. Alan Watt, the great uh, you know Zen commenter, always said that there's a taboo against knowing who you are. Jung commented on it. Freud commented on it. Nietzsche commented on it. Schopenhauer... Kierkegaard, they all mentioned this falling away from actual selfhood. We know what makes us the same as everybody else. All the institutions want to drum it into us, what makes us uniform and the same. We're very rarely taught, except by true teachers, what it is that makes us unique. Because the system isn't interested in really what makes us unique, except in a sort of a topical way, in order to keep the slave busy. But when it comes to real psychological and spiritual sovereignty, they're not interested. And that is the reason why we do not have political sovereignty. That is why it's eroded. That's why we don't have social sovereignty. That is why that is being eroded. Is because man does not have, nor does he even want, for the most part, psychological, moral, intellectual sovereignty. So the Ayn Rands are unread. The Alan Watts's are unread. They're forgotten. The psychologists are forgotten, except when it's the most topical spinner rack rubbish in order just to keep a sort of spring cleaning on your normal inauthentic existence. Because remember, dust gathers and everything. Rust will accumulate. So even in the best of lives, you're going to feel a little anxiety, a little frustration, a little, you know, hang-ups with your boyfriend, girlfriend, all the roles. The roles need maintenance. The roles need jump starts. So we have just enough psychology, just enough New Age gimmickry, just enough incense-waving towel-head shaman from the East, you know, snake-charming BS, just enough of the, that fake shamanistic nonsense, not the real thing at all, to spray paint to refresh, you see, to upgrade the inauthentic life. So the study of the inauthentic life is the study of the... Uh, and, and the opposite man, the man who's authentic, is what we refer to as the outsider. He is trying to handle, you know, the journey within. He is cutting through the briars and the bushes. He is traveling the, le the road less traveled. 
He is inner directed. He's not waiting for the world to turn him on and give meaning to his life because he realizes that he has to give meaning to the life. He is the one who realizes that it's not experiences that have to be constantly fresh and new, but the mind of the experiencer that must be always refreshed and anew. But the rest of the mankind does not want that. They're dead. They're morally dead or they're spiritually dead saying, world, turn me on. Give me more stimuli. Give me more things. Give me more stuff. And so what we have now in the modern world is an infantile level of, of, you know, development, spiritually and mentally, in which we just sit there hoping that the world is going to turn us on. And you know something? Big Brother is exactly what Big Brother wants to hear. Because those are the manufacturers of the lie. Those are the manufacturers of all the things that the narcissistic personality type demands. I've often said in my work that the ego is the, is the um, ghost that rose out of the grave of the self. And so only a return to selfhood is going to deal with the narcissistic self, is going to, you know, uh, balance the ego drives. You see, you can't, you can't troubleshoot it in an external way, sort of, you know, with a hammer and tongs. It's only when you, like Buckminster Fuller said, replace that system. And so a return to selfhood, individually, in a, in a psychological context, is the only remedy to all the other issues, be they political or social. I understand what those problems are, I study them myself, and I also know what their remedy is. But the remedy is in consciousness. It is the change of a man's consciousness that changes the rest of the world. And any other teacher, and there are many, be it the Tim Freakies or whoever it might be, who are trying to lead you away from that true sense of independence. These are the Pied Pipers of Doom, who are promising you global villages and global utopias and brotherhoods of man and, and, and you know, global diversity and multiculturalism and all the other nonsense that they you know, put in front of you. But what you've got to realize is that they're planting those, the foundations of that global village right on top of selfhood. They're putting it on the death, the corpse of selfhood. And so these people are pipe pipers of doom. But the man who's already abnegated his selfhood, who's already in absence of being, isn't he going to follow those people? Isn't he going to listen to those, the flute? And like the rats and the children who followed the Pied Piper, isn't he going to get in line as soon as he hears those clarion calls, which is exactly what you see in the world today? Because the greatest threat in our world is the selfless human being, the man who has no sense of who he is, no, he's absolutely, everything about him is conditioned by the world. He's just a role player. Not that roles are wrong, but they are wrong if they've taken the place of the authentic development, the authentic selfhood. And so from the parents to the schools to the priests and politicians, that's why you have that 100% you know, uh, dis the despise of selfhood and the crushing and the suppression of all forms of independence wherever you get it. That's why you have a media that sells you these kinds of models and sells you this pornographic nonsense and puts in front of you these theories that, you know, are about you losing your selfhood, immersing yourself in something that's, again, uniform in order to belong, in order to have approval. And of course, since in life, the way it works, you don't get the approval. So then we have now what? A neurotic individual. Uh, an individual who doesn't know whether he's coming or going. An individual who has to go to alcohol. An individual who has to go to gossip. An individual who has to take medications. An individual who's perpetually lost and perpetually out of control. Or super involved in the lives of other people. Or smother mothers. You see, or people who have to be constantly voyeuristic or constantly working all the time, which is a problem that you have in America, of the culture of just work, 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 so that you're avoiding the voice within. You're avoiding coming to who you really are. You're losing yourself in the role. Or people who've given themselves over to some God in the sky concept, which is what we know as religion. I'm not good enough. I'm a sinner. I'm too little. Let me give myself to the guru. <clears throat> Let me give myself to, you know, this projected higher man. There's a million and one ways in which man is escaping from his, from his authentic existence. And until there's a radical change in that field, you see, we're not gonna, we, we cannot hope to see change in other areas. All you will see is more um, decoration and more upgrading of the room of the inauthentic life, period. Michael, that was absolutely marvelous. And that was uh, exactly the sort of material I was hoping to get when I invited you onto the Zero Podcast in the first place. 